everyone, welcome to Movement Church Online. If you don't recognize me, my name is Devin and I'm glad to be here with you this morning. Psalm 103 verse 1 says, Let my whole being bless the Lord. Let everything inside me bless His holy name. Let's make that our shared goal for today. Maybe today you're logged on physically, but mentally you're checked out. Maybe for you it's the opposite. You're here mentally, but physically you're just exhausted. However you are feeling and whatever you're going through right now, let's declare with the psalmist that our whole being will bless the Lord as we jump into the second thing that God uses to grow our faith. All right, we are in week three of five things God wants to use to grow your faith. And here's the big thing that we've been saying throughout this entire series. God wants you to have perfect faith in him. And because most of us, and I think all of us, because none of us will ever get to a place of having perfect faith in him, God still wants us to actually grow our faith so that our faith in him can be as big as it can possibly be. Because, because God wants you to have a living, active, bold, strong, abiding faith in him because he knows that when you have that type of faith, the bigger your faith gets, the better everything about you gets. And so we're talking about how to grow our faith, how to have that big faith, that big trust in God, because the better our relationship with God is, the more we trust him, the better everything else about our life and about our relationship with God and our relationship with other people, the better everything gets. And now today I want to talk about this idea of private disciplines. That's right. Today we're talking about the D word discipline. And, and, and just so we can be a little less on edge, maybe about, about the word, we're not talking about discipline as punishment punishment. We're talking about those things that we don't want to do, but we know are good to do. And so we choose discipline. They're things that we don't want to do, but they're things that we know we should do. There's things that we don't want to do that allow us to do the things that we do want to do. So we choose discipline. Now here's my favorite definition and description of what discipline actually is. That discipline is training that corrects, molds, or perfects the mental faculties or moral character. Let me read that again. It's training that corrects, molds, or perfects the mental faculties or moral character. I love that definition because I think it gives us a great picture of the goal of discipline, which is to correct or to mold or perfect something about ourselves or maybe even to perfect or to grow and change our faith. And see, when I re read that definition, my automatic response and my automatic mental picture is actually someone attempting to bend or to curve would, which is something a lot of people don't actually realize is possible. But I, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you have ever attempted to bend or curve wood. Chances are you, you probably haven't. But it's a very delicate process that requires a lot of time because wood doesn't curve and it doesn't bend quickly. Um, and it requires just the right amount of pressure at just the right amount of time in the process so that you don't break the wood, but that you actually gently bend the wood, it's quite, it quite literally is disciplining or training wood to do something that wood doesn't naturally do, but when it's done properly, it can, it can actually turn into something that is really, really beautiful. And see, it's, 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 when we talk about discipline, it's a, funny, it's a funny thing. Sometimes the things that we do out of sheer discipline become addictions and become obsessions. Um, anyone who ever became a runner, you know this to be true. If you weren't naturally a runner, that there, you started this habit, you started this discipline, and over time, it became something that you actually really wanted to continue doing. Sometimes it becomes a hobby. Uh, maybe if, if you're a musician, this might be true of you, that maybe your parents made you take piano lessons as a kid, and it became something that you really, really enjoyed, and you became very good at in the process, but it wasn't something that you chose. It was a discipline, but the discipline became 
a hobby. Some disciplines, let's be honest, some disciplines are always a nuisance. Like anyone love eating, eating, uh, eating healthy and dieting? Like, does anyone love that? Like, I mean, like, like I know people who like the reward of eating healthy, but I don't think anyone ever gets to the point of being excited about choosing kale over choosing pizza. Like, let's just be honest. Like, I don't think anyone ever gets excited about that decision. And let's be honest, some decisions or some disciplines are so rewarding that they become obsessions. Um, like if, if you've ever talked to a Peloton user, Peloton users talk about this. Um, one of my friends from high school has lived like almost his entire adult life from, from high school into adulthood, into early adulthood, into, into his 30s, has lived most of his adult life at around, uh, at around or over 300 pounds. Um, and a few weeks back, I asked a question on Facebook, just kind of asking people for advice on exercise bikes and getting people different people's input. And this friend, he, he messaged me, he actually has messaged me multiple times, probably too many times, um, but he's, he's messaged me multiple times telling me, about the value of the Peloton that in the last year, as he and his wife embraced the Peloton lifestyle, I mean, exact words, as he embraced the Peloton lifestyle, he's lost over 70 pounds and has never felt healthier. And he's encouraged me that I should join the Peloton cult, I mean, the, the Peloton community, um, that I should join the Peloton community. But this is what people who have Pelotons thought that it's so rewarding, it actually becomes a little bit of an obsession. Now, as we talk about discipline, here's what we actually need to know, and here's why, here's why those things that are disciplines become habits. Here's why those things that are disciplines become hobbies. Here's why those things that are disciplines um, become obsessions. Is because discipline is a bad word with good results. Discipline is one of those words like when you hear discipline, there's something in every single one of us that kind of goes, oh, I don't like that word. Like, I don't like the thought of it. I don't like what it, what, it, what, it, what it probably means. It means choosing things that I don't want to choose and doing things that I don't want to do, even though I know there's something good. It's a bad word, but it has good results. So to talk about some of the results of discipline here, let me talk about a few things that we, we actually kind of know about discipline and why some of us choose it, even though it makes us feel icky, even though it makes us feel a little bit weird. Here's the first thing that's true about discipline. Discipl discipline results in progress. See, we rarely hear stories of, of people who make real and significant change and progress accidentally or through one single right move. And the reason that you don't hear those stories is because they don't exist. It takes discipline. It takes, there is no progress without discipline, without intentionally choosing the right things over and over and over again, and choosing to not do some things that we would like to do for the things that we know are better to do. It's discipline, right action leads to progress. The second thing that we know about discipline is that discipline results in freedom. Maybe it's financial, maybe it's health, health wise, maybe it's relationally, that this is one of those underrated aspects of discipline that when you do what you have to do that you don't want to do, it often ends up with you being able to do what you really, really want to do without the added pressure that comes from all those nagging things that you still have to do or know that you should do because all of those things have actually been taken care of. The discipline results in freedom. Here's the third thing we know about discipline and the results that it leads to. That discipline results in a good feeling. You're like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't result. No, no, notice I didn't say it starts with a good feeling, but it often ends up resulting in a good feeling. Think about like maybe sometimes it's even a rush. Notice, notice again, it's results and not it feels good at the beginning. When you talk to people who work out regularly, they will describe an endorphin rush that they get after their workout or after their run or after their bike ride that they just feel better after doing that exercise. If you've ever known someone who had paid off, who had some serious debt and they got really disciplined to pay it off, you know the rush they had every time they paid off a credit card debt or paid off a student loan or paid off a small of a small loan that they had taken out for a car or paid off, you know, whatever they had taken, like that every time they pay off a loan, they're like, yes, this is great. I feel so good. I want to just tackle the next thing. They got disciplined and it led to actually a really good feeling or maybe even a rush. And here's the fourth thing we know that discipline results in, that discipline is always beneficial. Discipline is beneficial. See, regardless of our attitude toward discipline, discipline is beneficial. This is actually really good news. This means that you can have a bad attitude toward discipline while choosing discipline, and discipline will still be beneficial for you. This is actually really good news. You can have the bad attitude. You can complain about it. You can kick your feet. You can like you can do all the things that you that that, that grrr, you can do all of that. And at the end of the day, if you're choosing discipline, discipline will still be beneficial for you. Choosing discipline will lead to progress and freedom and even positive feelings, whether you choose it with a great positive of attitude or whether you're kicking and screaming the entire time. The discipline is beneficial. See, that's, there's great value in discipline just from a life standpoint. Just from a life standpoint, there's great value in discipline. But 
In his Sermon on the Mount, and the reason we're going to talk about this today, in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught that there is even greater value when it comes to spiritual discipline. That to grow healthy, active, living, abiding faith in God, there are things that we need to, to do to exercise our faith muscles because our faith won't grow if we don't actually exercise our faith muscles. And getting even more specific, Jesus seemed to think that the greatest value didn't come in public disciplines or public expressions of worship or things that everyone saw, but that there was great, the greatest value was found in the things that we do that aren't seen and aren't recognized by anyone else. Let's go to Jesus. Here's what he said in Matthew chapter 6. He said this, watch out, watch out. If you're typing, if you're watching right now, would you maybe type in the space bar? Watch out. Maybe put an exclamation point, maybe all caps it just so everyone knows. Watch out. Now, if Jesus says watch out, if Jesus starts with watch out, it means there's something that we need to really be careful of, something that we really need to pay attention to. Jesus says, watch out. Watch out, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. Now, there was a common practice in ancient Jerusalem called almsgiving. And in this practice, beggars and, and, and the poorest of the poor would line up outside of the temple and actually kind of form almost this little like tunnel as you, as you were walking into the temple. And it was common pr- spiritual practice that if you were walking into the, into the temple and you had more than enough, that you would give to the poor, that you would give to those in need, that you would give to those who had lined up outside the temple. This is actually, this is actually a really good spiritual practice. And so we kind of hear that and go like, well, why would Jesus say that there was something wrong with that? Because along with the practice, there had come this like kind of side practice where, where people who had given what they believed was significant amounts to the poor and given significant amounts to those who were begging, they would walk into the temple, tell the priest, tell the people, tell the people inside, and they would blow trumpets and they would ring bells if, if people had given you know, uh, significant amounts. And so it wasn't just, oh, I'm giving to help the poor. It's I'm giving and I'm also getting recognition. When I walk in the doors and people ring the and someone rings a bell for me, people will know that I have given extraordinarily, that I that I've done something that's helpful to people. I've gained my recognition. And Jesus says simply, look, the problem isn't the giving. The problem is that you want the recognition more than you actually want to give. Jesus said this is ultimately supposed to be something that's private, something that's supposed to be something that you don't get attention for in, in public. This is not supposed to be a public spectacle. In verse three, Jesus went on, he said, But when you give to someone in need, Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, which sounds ridiculous, sounds extreme. Jesus was using the extreme example of how much we shouldn't be making a skeptical, a spectacle or attempting to get recognition. I I actually heard a a husband one time who who was talking about this verse. He said, yeah, so I, you know, I, to apply that verse to my life, like whenever I give something, I don't even tell my wife. And I thought, hey, that's not how you're supposed to interpret that verse. That is not the proper interpretation. Please stop doing that. I'll tell your wife you've been giving and not, you know, it's like, okay, give, 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 but like, you know, make sure you tell your wife, like that's not what this verse means. So when you give to someone and you don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will reward you, will reward you. This is interesting. Jesus promised a reward for what is done in private. Jesus promised that God, that God himself would reward us for what is done in private, for our private spiritual discipline. Interesting, huh? Moving on. Verse 5, it goes on to say that Jesus said this, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Once again, tradition had evolved around prayer in public. That it was, it was in public, it was on street corners, it was outside the temple, praying loud, lengthy, bold, audacious prayers. And people would stop and take notice of these great prayers because they were really great at praying in public. They were really great at praying a prayer that people would be drawn to and go, wow, what faith do they have? What amazing faith that they could pray like that on a street corner. Oh my goodness. And people would be inspired, not by the God they were praying to, but would be inspired by the person that was praying to God. 
And so Jesus is again saying, look, there's nothing wrong with praying. You should be talking to God. That's not the problem. The problem is you're going out to the street corner and you are not trying to gain the attention of God. You are trying to gain the attention and the admiration and the respect of other people who who come along and stand and, and, and join you. And it's almost turned into this competition of who can get more people to watch them pray. And Jesus had a problem with that because Jesus said, again, when it's done for public display, when you get public recognition, that's all you get. But God has a bigger purpose for prayer. God designed prayer to be done as something different. God designed prayer not to be done for public attention, but to be done to, for, for a reward that only God can give, that God has a reward for your, for your prayer in private. And so again, Jesus promised a reward from our Heavenly Father for what is done in private. Jesus promised a reward for what is done in private. Jesus promised a reward from our Heavenly Father for what is done in private, that there is a a reward for our private prayer, that there's actually something better than human recognition that God has to offer you in response to and as a reward for your prayer and your disciplined prayer in private. Then Jesus went in again on prayer. Again, for people who told others that there's no wrong way to pray, they wouldn't really like Jesus because Jesus seemed to think that there actually were some wrong ways to pray and that there was things that we could do better when it comes to our prayer. In verse 7, he said this, When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. You know, go, wait, wait, wait. Like if the point of prayer isn't telling God what we need, what's the point of prayer? Interesting, huh? Now Jesus seemed to think that there was far more to prayer than telling God what you need and what you want. Notice Jesus doesn't say there's anything wrong with telling God what you need and what you want. Jesus just said that there was more to prayer than that. And Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't want people to stop at telling God your needs and your wants. Jesus knew perfectly, this is amazing, Jesus knew perfectly what prayer is supposed to be. And Jesus continuously modeled prayer for his disciples. And what everyone came away from with Jesus was a knowledge that prayer is supposed to be intimate. Prayer is supposed to build a relationship. Prayer is supposed to be a conversation with our Heavenly Father. Prayer is supposed to build a relationship. It's supposed to be intimate. It's supposed to be letting out our emotions and our feelings and, and, and having conversations about our life and where we're going in our day with our Heavenly Father. And what Jesus knew and what everyone who watched Jesus pray and everyone who saw Jesus pray, what they knew is the way Jesus prayed and the type of relationship that God, that Jesus was building with his heavenly father and had with his heavenly father as a result of his prayer could not be done in public it had to be done in private Jesus knew there were things that prayer is supposed to accomplish that cannot happen in public and so he wanted us to know the value of our prayer being in private and then he went again in, in verse 16 he said this and when you fast And when you fast, don't make it obvious. Again, Jesus assumed that followers of him would would fast. He said, and when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. Again, people would fast and they would, you know, not, not get dressed, not take care of their hair, not take care of their face, and they would look tired and they would look hungry and they would look, oh my goodness, and people would go, oh my gosh, they're fasting. They're so spiritual. And Jesus said, look, they're doing that for the attention of other people and they get the attention of other people and that is all they will ever get. And Jesus said this, he said, but when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. See, I, I, th- I think this is so funny. I think Jesus would have cracked up over the way his followers today fast social media and, and begin the fast by announcing on social media that they are fasting social media. And everyone goes, oh my goodness, what a, what a beautiful, brave decision. And Jesus would go, when you make the dumb announcement, you have received all the reward that you will ever get. You might as well not even do the fast. Jesus is just simply saying that we, like, like at the end of the day, we don't do these things for public attention. When we do them for public attention, when we do them for public affirmation, we have actually received all the reward that we will ever get, and our Heavenly Father will not reward us for the things that we're doing. Jesus promised, again, Jesus promised something better, that there is a reward from our Heavenly Father for what is done in private. 
Jesus three times in these 18 verses, three times promised that God has a reward for what is done in private. Jesus promised that God has a reward for your private spiritual discipline. So here's the question, what's the reward? Like what like what's the what is the reward? Like multiple times Jesus promised a reward from our heavenly Father for our discipline in private. What is the reward? Like, what is it that our, that our discipline will get us from God? What, like, what can we expect from God in response to our discipline? Is it one of those things that, like, where it happens, where what happens in private becomes public, and so private discipline results in public promotion? Is it that we pay attention to the things of God in private, so God will pay attention to the, thing, to the public things that we care about? I mean, maybe. That might have something to do with it. But when you look at what Jesus says, and when you look at this in the context of what Jesus was talking about throughout the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount, I think one thing becomes really clear about what this reward is. The reward for private spiritual discipline is a growing trust in God. The reward for private spiritual discipline is a growing trust in God. And that's a big deal. It is the big deal. As we said from the beginning of this series, it's the thing that would make everything in your life and everything about your life and everything about your relationship with God and everything about your relationship with other people's. And it would make everything about your life Better, if there's a part of you that feels like this is a letdown, let me just remind you of what we have said about faith and trust in God all along in this series. The more trust you have in God, the more likely you are to resist temptation and therefore live without regret. Just imagine what life would be without some of the regret that you carry. And and looking forward, you go, wait, there's regret that I do not have to carry moving forward. Boom, that's a big reward. That if you could actually live with less regret, that's a big deal. We've said that the more you trust you have in God, the more confident you are that He is with you every moment of your life. So you don't look back, so you don't back down from life. You walk in life far more confident. Boom. Big reward. As your faith grows, as your trust grows, you have a far greater confidence as you walk through life. You have, the more trust you have in God, the more you lean on Him and His wisdom, meaning you don't have to figure out everything for yourself and your anxiety and your stress levels drop. Boom. This is a big reward. This is, this is a huge reward. This is not some like, oh, no, it's just, I, if, I, if I do this, the reward is I get to grow closer to God. That's a big reward. That's a big deal. If you grow closer to God, everything about you, everything about your relationship with God, and everything about your relationships with other people will get better because you will have more trust in God that leads you to the right things in every area of your life. And again, here's the thing. I know we're talking about the five things that God has used to grow our faith and, 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 our, and grow our trust in Him. And I mentioned the first week that, so, that for so many Christians and for so many churches, this is the only one we ever talk about. But here's the thing. There is a reason. There's a reason. This is the one that literally comes with a promise from Jesus explained by Jesus. That when we dedicate ourselves to the right disciplines in private, where we don't get any external praise or recognition, there is a far greater reward than external praise and recognition. It's the trust that grows inside of us as we connect in private with our Heavenly Father. So, so as, 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 we, as we begin to come to a close today, here, here, here's what I want to talk about. Today, I'm, I'm going to give one, one book recommendation, and I'm going to give a, a, a list of some spiritual disciplines that happen in private, some things that maybe, just maybe, would be a great idea for you to apply in your own life. Here's, a, here's the book recommendation. Um, one, of the best, one of the best books on spiritual disciplines and private disciplines that I have ever read was a book that I read um, during my second freshman year in college, which is not a joke. I transferred. And so, uh, so, so, the, so the, during my second freshman year, I read this book. And the book is titled Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. Um, Richard Foster was actually born in in New Mexico in 1942, which is kind of fun. Um, He became a Christian at an early age and personally follows many of the Quaker traditions that call for solitude and for quiet reflection um, as they they follow Jesus. I I, I read this book at the age of 19, and and I had grown up in church where we were taught to read your Bible and to pray and to read your Bible and to pray and to come to church and to read your Bible and to pray and come to church. And and, and for a person who actually, at that point in my life, thought that Christianity was mostly about going to church and reading my Bible and praying and reading my Bible and praying. This opened up an entirely new world of spiritual disciplines that have grown my faith in God 
over the years. So I would, I would say if, if you're looking for a great book on spiritual disciplines, if you're one of those people who, who learns great by, by, by reading this book, Celebration of Discipline, may be an incredible tool for you. If you're, if you're the type of person who doesn't want, want, want to read a book about spiritual disciplines, I'm, I'm going to give you a list. And this is not Richard Foster's list. This is a list of spiritual disciplines that throughout my lifetime and throughout different seasons in my lifetime have, have had huge reward for me, as I dedicated myself to some of these disciplines and, 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 and putting them into practice in my life in private. And so I know this is making it public, but my hope is that this might spark something in you that would help to grow something in you. So here's, so here's the list. I'm just going to go through them one at a time, and it'll, it'll form a list here on, on, on the screen as we go. Um, but here's the first one. It's Bible reading. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about how each of these works in your life. Bible reading, it informs and it focuses our faith. That's, the, that's, what, that's what we do when we read the Bible. It informs and it focuses our faith. It reminds us that we are part of a larger story, that there is a story that God is writing and we do have a part to play. There's, it helps us understand and know our Heavenly Father more. It helps us understand how the Holy Spirit wants to work in us and work through us. There, it helps us understand what G, the, the, the magnitude of what Jesus did and the significance of what Jesus did for us. It's, I mean, it's unbelievable. It informs and it focuses our faith. And I still remember the year that I became a Bible reader. It was during my first freshman year in college. It was during my first freshman year in college. I, I had been a person, again, who, who attended church, who attended church, who attended church who loved Jesus, but I never really read the Bible for myself. And I made the decision during my first freshman year, I made the decision to read the Bible for myself. And I cannot tell you in that year, I, like I, I have, I grew more than I have ever grown in my entire life as the Bible became something not that not just that was read from a stage, but that I could open up in my own personal life and see and, and, and recognize the words of God to me personally. The Word of God became personal, and it informs, and it focuses our faith. Let me give you the second one. It's prayer. It's prayer. Prayer is how we communicate with God. See, trust grows through communication. As we learn to communicate more and more, our trust grows. Not only that God hears, but that God speaks. That God hears our worry, our fear, our requests, our doubt, our frustration, and our tears, and that God will speak encouragement, hope, correction, clarity, and life. I'm telling you, when you pray, your faith and your trust in God grows and grows. So we hit Bible reading and prayer. And for many of us, let's be honest, that's where our list has stopped to this point. But I'm going to give you the rest of the list because this might be some of the things that as you dedicate yourselves to them, they may help you grow. So here's the next one, financial giving. When you make a decision to intentionally give financially to God, you learn the true meaning of the verse that I referenced last week, that you can give freely knowing that God knows and will meet your need. And this happens in two ways. He'll meet the need that the money you gave can no longer meet, and he will meet the needs that money can and could never meet. Because money can, we all, we all know this, money can buy a certain level of happiness, but money cannot buy joy. Money can provide a level of stability, but money can never buy security or peace. Those are things only God can provide. And when you prioritize God with your finances, He prioritizes giving, He rewards you with the things that money could never and can never buy. So we have Bible reading, prayer, financial giving. The next one is fasting. Taking a break. If you're wondering what fasting is, fasting is taking a break from something that you that you that is a big part of your life or a big portion of your life, something that you rely on, and taking the time that you usually would 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 you know spend on that and time and spend it in devotion to God, maybe in prayer to God, maybe in time reading your Bible. So you so fasting is 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 taking a break from something that we we rely on. And here's what happens as we fast. Fasting reminds you that you do not depend on bread alone or social media alone, or caffeine alone, or TV alone, or your computer alone, or your phone alone. When you take a break from that, it reminds you that you do not rely on that alone. When you take a break from the thing that you lean on, you remember who you really lean on. When you take a break from the thing that you that you lean, you tend to maybe lean a little bit too much of your life on, it reminds you who you actually can lean on. So we have Bible reading, prayer, financial giving, fasting, and here's the next one, scripture memorization. 
This is one of those things where some of us hear it and we go, yuck, I am terrible at memorization. I can't remember anything. I can't even remember how old I actually am. Like I told the other day some, someone that I was 35 and I was like, wait, I'm 37. Like, like, some, like some of us were like, I can't remember anything. Listen, for some of us, memorization is really difficult. For others of us, memorization comes really naturally. But for all of us, memorizing scripture is beneficial. When you have God's word hidden in your heart and deep within your brain, there is incredible, incredible value. And here's the value. There are moments in life and there are decisions that you'll face in life where you will not have the time to go and look up that encouraging verse you read a week ago. There are moments where you will need to have it buried deep in your brain and buried deep in your heart so that you can access and call it to memory in the moment that you need it. And when you, had, and when you face one of those moments, and I've faced many of those moments over my life, when you have those moments, you will be glad that you took some time and that you dedicated an hour over the course of two week, a two-week time frame to put to memory and to memorize the truth of God's word because it guides us and it is a light to our feet and a, and a, and a, lamp, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path that God wants to be that lamp and be that light for us as we hide his word in our heart through scripture memorization. So we have so we have so we have Bible reading, prayer, financial giving, fasting, scripture memorization. Here's the next one, journaling. Journaling is simply recording what God is doing in your life, what God is up to, what you're learning, what you're reading in scripture and why you think it matters, what you're praying for and the way that God is answering. It can be a great practice. It can be a great practice because it serves as history that if down the road you ever have a moment where you wonder, like, what has God ever done for me? You have it recorded. You have it recorded and you can revisit exactly what God has done for you. It can also also be an incredible thing to see your progress as you grow in your faith, as you grow your trust in God. The things that you once thought were huge deals, were big deals, were absolutely like massive things that you now look back on and go, oh my goodness, that was such a small thing. That it can provide perspective where maybe the things that you are now facing that you think are such a big deal Someday you will you 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 can go well. Someday I'll, I might just look back at this and realize that this was a very small part of my story. And then for you guys out there who think, well, journaling that sounds kind of like diary, like a diary, and that sounds really girly. One of my favorite quotes that I've ever heard on this came from Sarah McEachern, who's now Sarah Aitken, and she said, "A spiritual journal isn't girly; it's godly." To have a recorded history with God, it is not girly; it is godly. Helps you remember the things that you have learned. Helps you remember the progress that you have made and pushes us for more progress in the future. Here's the next one. It's worship. Worship. See, Sunday morning worship is great. It's public. That's public, which means the reward for our public worship is the great feeling and connection we have with God on Sunday morning. Your faith and your trust in God, it might go to a whole new level if you decide to make worship a part of your regular routine. You're like, wait, can you do that without a band? Absolutely. See, there's these amazing things called headphones and speakers, and there's a bounty of great worship music out there available for every single one of us through Spotify and Apple Music and whatever service you want to use. Like, there is a great amount of incredible worship music, and you just put some of that on in your headphones or through your speakers or in your car, and you just jam out with God. And here's the thing you think, like, what does that do? It simply reminds us every day of the goodness of God, and we declare it, and we declare it over our lives, and when we declare it with our mouths, our heart is reminded, and our mind is reminded of the truth of the goodness and the greatness of God. It's a great thing to practice, a regular practice of worship. Here's the next one, Sabbath. It's a regular pause in your schedule, and it reminds you that you don't depend on you and your effort. And if you're a person who loves to work and loves to accomplish and loves to see what your effort and your work can do, for, for you, one of the best practices that you could ever develop may just be to remind yourself regularly that you do not depend on your work and your effort, but you depend on your heavenly Father. And then the final one is this. It's what I would call solitude. It's a regu- and, and the thing is, re- regularly removing ourselves intentionally from, from other people, it reminds us that while our faith is lived out in community, it's also lived out in very personal, private moments as well, and that when life is just you and God, you actually have everything that you need. That solitude, intentionally removing yourself from other people for, for, for a time, and just having time alone with God can remind you that when you when it's just you and God, you have everything you need. If you're a super extrovert, <laughs> if you, th- this sounds like punishment, right? If you're a super extrovert, this sounds like punishment. This could be one of the best practices for you when it comes 
to growing your faith and growing your trust in God because it's scary. And where there's scary, you will learn that you can trust God. So here's the thing. As you think about growing your faith and maybe putting in, in, into practice some of these private disciplines, here's one piece of advice that I would give you today. Don't do all of this at once. Don't, don't take that list and go, all right, well, tomorrow I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read my Bible, I'm going to pray, I'm going to fast, I'm going to have a time of worship, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a Sabbath, and I'm going to do, do, do some solitude, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to give. And I'm like, don't, don't do all of this at once. See, if you do all of this at once, if you go out and you try to do that all, all tomorrow, it'll be chaos and you will get nothing out of it. Here's what I would say. Pick one private discipline and develop the habit. Pick one private discipline at a time and develop the habit. And then once you've developed the habit, you can move on to another one and another one. You can do it. These aren't things that I do every day. These aren't things that I do necessarily every week, but these are all things that God has used over time in my life and uses consistently to grow my faith. And I promise as you develop the habit, God will use those habits and those private disciplines to grow and blow up in the best way possible, your trust in Him. See, God has a reward for how we honor Him with our time and attention in private. And the reward is a growing trust in Him and a growing trust in what He'll do as we follow Him. See, Eugene Peterson, the, the pastor who created the Message Bible, attempting to put the truth of Scripture into modern language, when asked why his morning spiritual routine was so rigorous, because people knew his morning routine was incredibly rigorous in, in, in private before he ever stepped his foot out the door, his, his routine, spending time with God. We, so he's, he was asked, why, why is your routine, morning routine so rigorous? He said this, I must be prepared for the day ahead. I am a man living in anticipation of following Jesus for the next 18 hours or so. And that's how we're called to live. And if we're going to have the strong living act of faith to actually do that, to actually follow Jesus closely and to walk out the ways in the life of Jesus for, 18, for the next 18 hours, every single one of us, we need some private disciplines to keep us growing, to keep strengthening our faith, to keep reminding us what it's always been about and what it is still about today, that it's about our trust and our faith in God that affects everything else that we do. So we need private disciplines to strengthen and grow our faith and our trust in our Heavenly Father. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, today I just simply pray for every single one of us, God, that you'd give us wisdom to know what to do with what we've just heard. God, give us the wisdom to know what are the spiritual disciplines that we need to put into practice in our own lives. Give us the wisdom to know what the, what the private disciplines are that you want to use to grow us right now. And God, I pray that not only would you give us wisdom to know what it is that we're supposed to do with this, God, give us the courage and the backbone and the actual just plain discipline to do it. God, that it will be difficult tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day, and it'll be difficult until it becomes easy. And God, when it, when it begins to become natural, that's the place where you will speak to us. And so God, I pray that you'd give us the discipline and the backbone to actually put this into practice because we want our faith to, to grow in you. We want our trust in you to grow. So God, would you use these private disciplines to grow our faith in you? Thank you for the reward that Jesus promised. And God, we ask that you would help us to receive it in Jesus' name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
What a great time we've had together. Thank you for being here. Before you go and enjoy the rest of your day, we have a few things that we want to mention. First, we want to give you the opportunity to give. There are two ways that you can do that. You can text 84321 with a dollar sign followed by the amount that you want to give, or you can visit our website, mvmnt.church giving and give online. However much and in whichever way you choose to give, thank you for practicing generosity. Next, if you have a need, we would love to hear from you. Please feel free to message us on Facebook, give us a call, or send us an email so that we might be able to help you with that need if we can, or pray with you in that need. Lastly, parents, we would love for you to head to our Facebook page or YouTube channel and check out our weekly videos for kids. They're live right now for you and your children to enjoy, whether they are in preschool or all the way up through elementary school. Each video is packed with biblical truth to help your child also grow in their relationship with Jesus. That's all we have for you today. Thank you so much for being with us and we'll see you next time.